The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Best Damn Podcast. I'm your host, John Keen. As always, I would like to thank you guys for joining me. Ask that you please add, follow, and check us out, www.thebestdampodcast.tv. Follow me, Instagram, Best Damn Podcast, Twitter, The Real Best Damn, and wherever you're watching from, please make sure to subscribe, follow, leave a comment, let me know what you think, and don't forget to share this link, and keep in mind guys, we are completely viewer powered, that means we're fully funded and supported by you, the listener, and the viewer, all the donation links are in the description box down below, Uh, tonight we've got a pretty good one for all of you guys, Uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, celestial phenomenon that is going on uh, pertaining to you know many many heavenly bodies that have been coming in as of recently and have been creating some well quite frankly some pretty chaotic situations all across the globe Uh, everything from large sinkholes to earthquakes and seismic activity to massive waves and just all types of uh you know insanity across the globe it's been a while since i've done one of these uh tonight we might also be getting into a little bit of worlds in collision as well as discussing magnetic reversal and the end of a catastrophic cycle and what that might look like for everybody so uh buckle up it should be a pretty good one so if you're in the chat right now let me know if you guys can hear me and see me let me know if you can hear and see everything before i go ahead and get started hopefully we're, we're doing good i'm not st- no i'm i will be streaming on best damn podcast official and bdp2 tomorrow guys tomorrow i get the two main channels back so look for me on the main channels tomorrow uh, Best Damn Podcast Official and BDP2. Uh, but still, make sure to subscribe on John Boy 513 and The Best Damn Podcast. Because like I said, I'm going to be converting these channels to astrology and tarot channels. I've got so much cool stuff. guys. I started, I started writing a book. I mean, I am just working my ass off here lately. Just uh, the creativity has been flowing in. So um, yeah, big ups to everybody on Twitch, Facebook, DLive, YouTube youtube uh trovo linkedin uh yeah thank you guys we'll start here out of interesting engineering a speedy asteroid suddenly appeared and flew past earth in just 30 minutes astronomers now know its orbit for the next 100 years and this one what caught my eye about this is was allegedly this particular asteroid when it flew past it came from our blind spot if you guys know anything about some of my older videos which i had to take down on all the main channels but you can find a lot of them here on john boy 513 hint hint uh for people that are still looking for that um was that it came from the blind spot and it reminded me of That country that is, uh, you know, associated with uh, the the Red Army of the East, and they're in the north, and they launch a lot of missiles all the time. Yeah, that country, they fly uh, a couple of satellites over the U.S. like twice a day that actually come from our blind spot. So when I seen this, I connected the dots, and I thought, man, I wonder how crazy it would be, you know, if... Uh, they blamed something like this on you know somebody else but i don't want to really get into that and go ahead and get strikes on these channels too so we'll just start here on july 25th 2019 astronomer luis fernanda zambrano martin and her team at the arecibo observatory in puerto rico spotted a fast traveling asteroid headed towards earth flying in from a blind spot The asteroid gave the astronomers a window of barely 30 minutes to learn as much about it as they could, SciTech reported, and then it was gone. Near-Earth objects or comets or NEOs, 
NEOs are asteroids that come within a distance of 1.3 astronomical units. Sorry, guys. 1.3 astronomical units. And I lost my spot here. <laughs> Sorry. 1.3 astronomical units. There are nearly 30,000 asteroids that are known to us. While any such object is wider than 460 feet, it's considered a potentially hazardous object. And this is why astronomers try to keep a close eye in the skies for asteroids that might be heading towards the Earth. And we'll go down here and you can see here what happened in 2019. And you know, and this has been kind of like a, a relatively, uh, you know, normal thing now, these large ass asteroids that are coming through. And when they do, you know, go past the Earth, they're coming from blind spots. And I've talked about this before, how isn't it convenient that they'll say, oh yeah, we located it just after it passed the Earth or five minutes before it went past the Earth. And then you have all of these, you know, um, federal exercises essentially, right, where not only just the U.S. government, but world governments are coming together with these large uh, exercises for asteroid impacts and, you know, all of these different scenarios. And most of them are preparing for the aftermath of such a scenario. And then, you know, we're going to look at some other things tonight. And they're showing how asteroids are now coming fr from behind the glare of the sun and they can't be seen. This just is really reminiscent of Planet X, Planet Nine, and the theories that we've heard swirling around that for years and years, right? When it comes to the dragon, that yes, it's coming from behind the sun. You won't see it until it gets here. Yes, it's got a big giant tail of trash, and we're going to talk about a bunch of meteors as well tonight. So it goes right along with it. Yes, there's big cloud of dust and debris around it. Well, how conveniently we see all of these stars now that are coming in or coming past, especially in particular comets with their ionized tails, and they're giving off these big blasts of gas and uh you know and they'll say hey and uh you know it goes so fast by the time it actually makes the turn we won't be able to even announce this shit and here you go right it's coming from the blind spot once again so brother on martin and her team at the university of central florida that managed the aristibo observatory on behalf of the national science foundation in july 2019 the team's radar scientists received an alert about an incoming asteroid the team knew nothing about it since it had not been spotted before it was coming from a blind spot for earth the solar opposition the team sprang into action to collect as much data about the asteroid as they could however traveling at a relative velocity of over 14 miles a second the astronomer had very little time on their hands to record their data. In the end, the team barely got 30 minutes worth of observation time with the asteroid, but that was sufficient to provide details about its size, type, and what keeps it together. And everybody in the chat, please make sure to hit that thumbs up, hit that like for me. Uh, that helps big time with the algorithms and as far as getting the video out there for people to see. And uh, if you can, whatever social media you're watching from, share this link for me as well. Make sure you're, you know, you subscribe to. That's uh, that's major. And uh, if you can, consider donating and supporting as well. The links are in the description box below. So Asteroid 2019, okay. The researchers found out the asteroid was relatively small between 229 feet to 422 feet in diameter which is just below the threshold for calling it potentially hazardous that's still pretty decent size apart from the high speeds the asteroid was also rotating very fast about three to five minutes which puts it in the category of a very fast rotating asteroid that we'd rather know a little bit about asteroid 2019 ok is also a c type asteroid a rather common type of asteroid found in our solar system these are likely made up of clay and silicate rocks and given its fast rotation rate it needs a, mi a minimum cohesion rate of 350 pa to not fall apart this is much lesser than the internal strength of fractured rocks on earth the researchers wrote in their paper that was published the planetary science journal last month which i have the paper right over here the arecibo observatory telescope collapsed in 2020 and the researchers are currently scanning through the troves of data collected over four decades to carry out their research based on the data they collected in 2019. The team has mapped out the orbit of asteroid 2019 OK for 100 years, the paper said. 
But if you would like to see some airplane-sized asteroids zip within a few million miles from Earth, you can do so this very week. Two of them, relatively smaller, will come close to under 5 million miles from Earth on July the 24th, which, uh, you know, here you go, with another asteroid, 2022 OA, discovered only this year, will swoop past us at just 1.2 million miles away on July the 25th. And here's a little piece from the abstract, which I have that right here. The Planetary Science Radar and Optical Characterization of Near-Earth Asteroid 2019. And just a little highlight from the abstract here. It says, we conducted radar observations of near-Earth Asteroid 2019 OK on 2019 July 25th using the Arecibo Observatory. Five band, looks like 2,380 millihertz or 12.6 centimeter planetary radar system based on Arecibo and optical observations. The apparent diameter is between 70 and 130 meters combined with an absolute magnitude of the optical albedo of 2019. Okay, is likely between 0 0.05 and 0 0.17. Our measure radar circular polarization ratio of 0.33 plus 0 0.03 indicates 2019 okay is likely not a V or E type asteroid and is most likely a C or S type. The measured radar echo bandwidth of 39 restricts the apparent rotation period to be approximately between 3 minutes and 5 minutes. Together, the apparent diameter of the rotation period suggests that 2019 OK is likely not a rubble pile body found only by gravity, but 2019 OK is one of a growing number of fast rotating near Earth asteroids that require some internal strength to keep them from breaking apart. So there you have it, guys. 2019 OK. I guess we'll be okay, won't we? Uh, well, 2019, okay. So now moving forward here, and I, I've got nothing but crazy sp space news tonight, too. Some really cool stuff, actually. In the glare of the sun. And wait till we get into some of these other articles. It's going to blow your mind, some of the shit that's been taking place as a result of, you know, we'll call it climate chaos, right? I don't really care what you call it. It's fucking ape shit, some of the things that are happening these days uh, around the planet. And I believe it's all as a result of the magnetic reversal. And we're going to probably take a, a peek into Chan Thomas's um, Adam and Eve story, the CIA, uh, formerly CIA uh, document on magnetic reversal and pole shift. Just kind of get a refresher. I want to look at a little bit of that towards the end of the video. Oh, shit. All right, here. In the glare of the sun, in the glare of the sun, asteroid surveys generally operate at night, mostly finding objects beyond Earth's orbit. This creates a blind spot because many NEOs could be lurking in the sunlight interior of Earth's orbit. New telescopic surveys are braving the sun's glare and searching for asteroids towards the sun during twilight. These surveys have found many previously undiscovered asteroids interior to Earth, including the fast asteroid with an orbit interior to Venus and an asteroid with the shortest known orbital period around the sun, 2021 PH27. The other one was 2020 AB2, I think is what it says. NEOs are classified into different dynamical types. Starting from the most distant are the Amores, which approach Earth but do not cross Earth's orbit. Apollos cross Earth's orbit but have semi-major axes greater than the Earth and Ottens also cross Earth's orbit but have semi-major axes less than that of Earth. Atiras also called uh, Apoheli have orbits completely interior to Earth and Vatiras have orbits completely interior to Venus with 2020 AB2 being the first known. 
NEOs have dynamically unstable orbits of 10 million years. A reservoir must exist that replenishes the NEOs because their numbers have been a steady state over the past few billion years. Most NEOs are likely dislodged objects from the main belt of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. Physical observations show that NEOs are similar to the main belt asteroids with a small fraction being dormant comets from the outer solar system. And I wonder what replenishes the asteroid belt. Could it be catastrophic cycles and the Earth gets ripped a new one every, you know, three, four hundred years or so? Just saying, you know, and if you look at the moon, it looks like it's been peppered a few times. Uh, Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere left. Mercury looks a little rough around the edges, you know, and Venus more than likely is probably a large ass asteroid that was or a moon or satellite of Jupiter that was flung out of orbit, you know, so I think there's a good reason of why uh, these asteroids seem to keep being replenished. You know, are they being drug in from, you know, the trans-Neptunian objects, right? The Oort cloud at the very edge of the system by a binary companion. You know, who knows, right? Some people would say, yeah, that's a, that's a possibility. Now, MBAs with orbital periods near whole number ratios with Jupiter's period are depleted, which indicates that these areas are dynamically unstable. Small MBAs continually move into these unstable regions and are ejected from the main belt of asteroids through Yarkovsky effect, which slowly changes an asteroid's orbit through the nonostropic emitting of absorbed sunlight. The movement depends on the asteroid's rotation, size, albedo, and distance from the sun. The smaller an asteroid is and the more sunlight it absorbs, the larger its movement. Fewer Atiras should exist than the more far distant NEOs and even far fewer Vatiras because it becomes harder and harder for an object to move inward past Earth and then Venus's orbit. Random walks of NEOs orbit through planetary gravitational interactions can make an Aten into an Atira or a Vatira orbit and vice versa. Atira should make up some 1.2%, Vatiras only 03 and total NEO population coming from the main belt of asteroids. 2020 AB2 itself will spend only a few million years in a Vatira orbit before crossing Venus's orbit. Eventually, 2020 AB2 will either collide with or be tidally disrupted by one of the planets, disintegrate near the sun, or be ejected from the inner solar system. Recent NEO models predict that there should be less than one Vatira, the roughly 1.5 kilometer diameter of 2020 AB2, but many more smaller ones. Only a fraction of the sky has been searched where Vatira-like asteroids reside. However, because of the scattered light problem from the sun, only the largest are observable. Finding a relatively large Vatira in the little area searched is somewhat unexpected, but small number statistics have caveats when trying to understand a whole population. Only a few asteroid surveys have imaged interior to Venus with published results, but the null results of others may be unpublished, making it hard to determine how much space interior to Venus has actually been well searched. This makes it difficult to get a true handle on Vatira discovery statistics. Recently, the asteroid with the smallest known semi-major axis at 0.46 astronomical units was found, 2021 PH27. Because of 2021 PH27's large eccentricity of 0.7, its orbit actually crosses both the orbits of Mercury and Venus, making it an Atira and not a Vatira asteroid. 2021 PH27 approaches so close to the Sun at about 1.5. 0.13 AU that it has the strongest general relativity effects at almost one arc minute precession per century of any known object in our solar system including Mercury. 2021 PH27 surface likely gets to 500 degrees Celsius which is hot enough to melt lead. 2021 PH27 is also apparently one kilometer in size which is relatively large. However, because the diameter of these interior asteroids is calculated with an assumed albedo and solar phase function, the actual diameters for both of these discoveries could be under one kilometer. This would then put it in a more expected population and make them less of a statistical fluke. And you can see here the image. Let's see if we can make it bigger. This is how they classify the asteroids in their orbit. You can see Amor, Apollo, 
Aten, Atira, Vatira, Vulcanoids, right? And this is the main belt of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. And, you know, new discoveries made every day. It's actually pretty crazy. Uh, you know, and one would say that this is direct evidence of something that's approaching the Earth. But you could also say that this is direct evidence of technology getting a lot better as well right our satellites getting a lot sharper um our ability to spot these things getting a lot better too so i mean that kind of goes both ways you know just saying um to back up both sides of the argument but to me this is these are the smoking guns if you will um of something is a miss when it comes to the planet and this is what's going to go hand in hand with some of the text we're going to look at towards the end mega drought is spreading across the world two lakes dry up in switzerland with one being refilled videos and pictures you can see here the image lakes completely drying up this is fucking crazy the mega drought is not just slamming the western u.s nearly half of the european union is exposed to warning levels of drought, 46% warning drought levels, and 11% extreme alert level. A staggering portion of Europe is currently exposed to warning and alert drought levels associated with either soil moisture deficit or its combination with vegetation stress, the report author said. This is exactly what Switzerland is experiencing right now, where at least two lakes have dried up over the last days. Meanwhile, one of them, located in the Alps, has been refilled. Drought is raging in Switzerland. The Lac des Brenes, located le near Le Local, between Switzerland and France, is nothing more than a small trickle of water after the river flowing into the lake was swallowed by cracks or sinkholes. Look at that picture right there, guys. All the boats sitting on dry land. That is creepy, actually. Uh, the image is painful to look at. The Lac des Brenes, Swiss name, or Lac de Chalion, French name, on the river, dues on the border of Switzerland and France, is completely dry. Look at those images. Wow. Look at that giant lake. I mean, completely stone cold dry. All the boats just sitting there on the sand. That is crazy. The depression in which the lake lies was formed by the movement of a glacier. With the lake itself was formed by natural barrier around 12,000 years ago. At the downstream end is a waterfall known as Sat Du Dus, which is also dry. Wow. And I can't really read this French here, uh, but you can see the images of the rock and the soil all dried out and cracked. That is absolutely insane. And are these from like, um, you know, large sinkholes underground draining all of this water from crustal displacement? as part of magnetic reversal right pole shift is that what's going on here or are we seeing because of extreme heat um you know extreme evaporation into the water i mean what is you know really uh happening is my question here navigation on la de Brenet has also been stopped on wednesday july the 13th after the level of water dropped below the limit due to the ongoing drought you see the images here. This is exceptional, according to Yang Durig, the captain of a tourist boat. It's exceptional. Navigation already had to be interrupted in 2018 and 2020, but only in September, not mid-July. No heavy rainfall has been registered in the area over the last two months, and the lake started losing water very quickly, up to 21 centimeters, or 8.3 inches per day, which we have never seen before. Karst cracks and sinkholes on the French side of Hot Du sector has been on drought alert since July 8th to limit the use of water to the strict minimum. But beside the drought, there is also geological explanation behind the disappearance of the lake and its water. At the end of June, Van Durig indeed recalled water leaks identified in the Du basins as well as karst cracks and sinkholes. They are located upstream near Muth, explained Ves Durig, occurring to him the water from the Douves River leaks into another French river La Louis through the cracks and sinkholes, thus drying up the river and lake. 
Lake Chakul in Nindaz, also called Lake Noir, for the dark color of its water, alt at 2200 meters above sea level a few days ago, it was reported almost completely dry by regular wanderers. And you can see the images before and after. Look at that shit, fam. Wow. That's crazy. And it's all in the same spot, too. So this lets you know that, um, you know, this has to do with uh, geographical location. So something probably seismically underneath those plates, you know, in that area is going on. I believe it would probably be due to some type of, uh, you know, form of crustal displacement, right? Sinkholes, um, extreme heat from magma coming up, causing extreme evaporation. Something's really amiss there. Uh, it says the popular tourist attraction has unique ecosystem. is home to many amphibians, in particular common frogs, alpine newts, and starting points for hiking trails. And there's been many severe conditions in several countries due to a lack of rain. In addition to early heat waves across Europe, severe drought is expanding and worsening. Let's see if we can see some of this here. And... Climate change increased the risk of severe droughts, forest fires in the world. And see, that's another thing. It's not just the drought. It's these fires as well, man. From southern Spain to northern... Whoa, shit. And... see it. I don't know if you guys can hear. Probably not. We'll go ahead and move on anyways. It's in French, so. Moving forward here. As Western Europe burns, thunderstorms, record-breaking hail, floods, and sub-average temperatures hit Russia. The intense heat wave that is currently affecting a large part of Central, Western, and Northern Europe has had opposite consequences on the other side of the continent. And this is crazy. The scorching air that pushed hot air from the African latitudes up to Scandinavia has kept an active flow of colder currents on the far east of Europe, in particular on Russia, where for days the temperatures have overall been below average. And look at that, dude. Ice blocks falling from the skies in Russia. Got to be shitty, me, man. In one place, you've got severe, um, you know, heat water evaporating look at this dude and then another you've got ice blocks fucking raining down very crazy very crazy Let's see if we can get this ad out of the way here and I don't have the sound on so I'm trying not to get a copyright on this wow you can't even hardly see there's so much ice raining down, literally. So much ice raining down, you can't even really see what's going on in the video. Look at that, man. Wow. Uh, but cooler than normal weather was not only the noteworthy event. When the colder air came in contact with the heat, dangerous thunderstorms hit. An apocalyptic storm covered the city of Lipetsk, Russia, and several inches of hail and large rivers of hail started flowing down the streets within minutes after the temperatures dropped by 9 degrees Celsius almost instantly. Let me see. Look at that. Craziness. <laughs> Craziness. A similar situation affected the city of Okavaka, also in southern Russia, while the city of Nizhny Novograd was hit by a violent flash flooding event. Wow, keep in mind that other parts of Russia are currently being ravaged by gigantic swarms of locusts, insects, heat, or heavy hail. It's all bad for crops and food security around the world. And you know what? Don't just keep that in mind. The locust, the hail, all this stuff, man. Uh, this, this is all in the Colburn when it talks about the coming of the destroyer. You know, every last bit of this is. So, uh, you know, if you remind me before we get done with this tonight, I'll, I'll pull some of that up and, you know, show you the reference on that. It's pretty crazy, but we got a lot more. So, let's see. Massive waves crash Hawaii wedding, Tahiti and Cook Island beaches, state of emergency in American Samoa. 
massive waves in Hawaii. You can see the picture there. They're all getting married and shit, having a good time. And then next thing you know, uh, that would suck. A bride and groom weren't expecting this kind of wedding crasher as they tied the knot over the weekend in Hawaii. Giant waves was bombarded Riley and Dylan Murphy's reception area on Saturday. The massive wave was seen crashing over seawall at a resort on Hawaii's Big Island. As the water moved into the reception area, guests were left running to late cover, but many were left soaked. Let's see if we can get an image of this here. Look at that. Look, everybody's taking off. Few people already feel it. They're like, oh, let's get out of here. Wow. Wow. You know, and this is just... I, I still feel like we haven't seen nothing yet. Like, that's where I'm at with it. Like, I feel like climate-wise, we haven't seen shit yet. The bride said that despite the water sweeping away half of their reception, their wedding turned out to be a memorable night. Massive waves and high surf were seen in other parts of the Big Island over the weekend thanks to the remnants of Hurricane Darby. The wave in Kona was even higher than a two-story building. Look at that. It just washed over that two-story building. Did you guys see that? Let me take it back. Look at that. Wow. Now, you know that's intense if a wave is literally hitting over top of a two-story building. Man, I would not be comfortable living that close to the water. I'm just saying. You know, you would know that any any minute, you know, if there was a massive, uh, you know, uh, cataclysm or something like that, you know, living on uh, an island, dude, you're fucked. <laughs> You know, but I guess you're screwed anywhere you're at, you know, if uh, you got tsunamis and tidal waves. On Saturday, oceanfront buildings along Kiohu, Kona took the brunt of the historic surf conditions. Swells were forecast to reach as high as 20 feet along the southern coast of Hawaii Island. Uh, Cook Islands and Tahiti also hit. It was sudden hit at night. There was damage that took place Tuesday night local time. An unexpected sea surge, rough seas, debris and rocks, you name it. It was shifted onto the road. Let's see here. This is all over the road now. Low-lying coastal areas in Pakura District along Tikaveka and Takitumu district were the most likely severe impacted areas. You see the aftermath here. Looks pretty, uh, you know, trashy after the fact. Wow. Look at that, man. That's what I'm saying. I don't see how these people do it, dude. How these people live that close to all this, man. And finally, national emergency operation teams were activated to three villages to support the infrastructure as they were busy. Strickland said while things have settled down early on Thursday morning, local time we received reports of Northern Islands experiencing high seas resulting in the closure of schools. These are Cook Islands damaged by swells. Hmm. Emergency services remain on high alert. Fresh warnings have been issued in northern parts of Cook Island. And see, and this is just the tip of the iceberg here. This shit's going on everywhere. Um, I know you guys have heard of this. Matter of fact, uh, I want to give a shout out to Derek Bros, the global witness. Because I will say this, man. I, I wonder if the FBI's kicked down his fucking door yet. Um, whenever the Georgia Guidestones, uh, you know, were peacefully uh, blown up. <laughs> you guys remember how it was a peaceful explosion? If you guys will remember when that happened, I seen that Derek had tweeted, Hoover Dam is next. Swear to you, he tweets, Hoover Dam is next, and then boom. Explosion at Hoover Dam. Prepare yourself for electricity price hikes and widespread power outages. You can see right there. Police confirm they have crews on the way to Hoover Dam, which sits at the border of Arizona and Nevada along the Colorado River. The extent of the damage and the cause of the fire not yet known. The video posted earlier to social media appeared to show a small explosion. 
videos at different angle, probably transformer failure. And you can see all of them all backed up here. Let's see if we can get the actual image. At least they didn't blow the whole fucking thing out, you know? Well, yeah, well, you know, the, they made that a lot bigger than it was. An explosion and subsequent fire shocked visitors in Hoover Dam in Nevada. Boulder City Fire Department en route to emergency call at Hoover Dam. And something is, my goodness, something has just blown up. And you can see the images here. The lower Colorado Regional Director at the Bureau of Reclamation, Jacqueline Gold, said in a statement at approximately 10 a.m., the A5 transformer at Hoover Dam caught fire and was extinguished by the Reclamation Hoover Fire Brigade at approximately 10.30 a.m. I wonder if this is a dry run for, you know, something bigger at a future date. You know, uh, or if this is some type of uh, smoke signal for... You know, maybe an event of some sort. You know, who knows, guys? Honestly, with all the shit that's going on these days, I don't put much past anything, really. <laughs> Just to keep it real. What's brewing in the Hudson? Mysterious bubbling in the river baffles scientists. And see, this is what I'm saying. This is the weirdest shit ever, right? You got water disappearing, water overflowing into the streets, you know, uh, it raining ice, and then boiling water. Roiling water seen in the Hudson Bank at Bowline Point Park is puzzling local environmentalists. The State Department of Environmental Conservation so far can't pinpoint what caused the bubbly water along Bowline Point Park. Let's see if we can take a look at the bubbling water. See the bubbling water here. Pretty weird. Meanwhile, a plume of black smoke seen in the area the same morning, July 13th, also remains uh, under the scrutiny of the DEC. Right here, both incidents detected within a few hours of each other occurred in the vicinity of the Bowline Point Power Generator in West Haverstraw. So there you have it, right? Um, Transformer explosion, Hoover Dam. And then... You have the bowline point power generator, black smoke, and then boiling water. I would almost guarantee the two are connected. And I've talked about the grid down scenario in the United States. And I've also talked about, uh, well, let's just say there's three main um, areas where electricity flows in this country. And you could knock out 75% of the power by taking down one. And that's on the West Coast. So just kind of keep that in mind as you see all these little attacks, not only on food supplies um, previously, but now we're seeing different, you know, power stations and forms of power that are, uh, you know, being attacked. So, you know, you, 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 you put two and two together. According to officials at Rocklands County Office of Fire and Emergency Services, a smoke plume was a temporary situation linked to incomplete combustion at the Bowline plant, but there was no fire. Bowline also notified the Fields Fire Department in the case they received any calls. County officials said to avoid any unnecessary response. DEC officials said the plant was tasked with monitoring the location where the bubbles were reported twice daily, and they will also continue its monitoring and oversight of the facility and there's the image of all the bubbling water there the bubbly water was spotted in owen Krasme, who lives 35 and 62 years in garnerville he took the picture just about every morning along the hudson which can be seen on his instagram And these are just different images of the bubbling water there there's dude kicking it like oh the water was bubbling man i don't know I ain't never seen that shit before. But there was giant black smoke plumes rolling, so I'm sure it had something to do with it. How about this? And think about all the water disappearing. Now look at this. Giant sinkhole drained swimming pool in seconds during party in Israel killing one. Video and pictures. That's crazy. Look at that sinkhole. Imagine the bottom of your pool just busting out and sucking you down like a whirlpool. That would suck. 
a huge sinkhole opened up under a swimming pool and swallowed up the entire volume of water and colorful inflatable toys during an outdoor party in Israel, leaving the pool empty as guests dangerously stood around the edge of the hole. Sadly, one person was injured while another body was found inside the pit hours later. That would suck, dude. That would absolutely suck. And why the fuck would motherfuckers still be swimming in this damn thing after it's done sucked people? Like, honestly, why would you jump into it after the fact? What is wrong with you? Like, you ain't... Wow, dude, that's just... <laughs> talking about just stupid... Why you would jump into that hole after it drained an entire pool? It had a f enough force to pull an entire Olympic-sized swimming pool into nothing. And then your dumbass going to jump into the hole. The giant sinkhole opened up in a private pool in the yard of Abia and Carme Yosef during a marketing company's pool party on Thursday with two people being swept into it. One of them, a 34-year-old man, rescued himself while the body of the other was found after hours of searches by emergency services. That's sad. 34-year-old man who was at the party and fell into the pit is in a light condition, conscious and suffering from injuries to his limbs. The dead body was recovered. Hours later at the end of a 15 meter long cavity. So it took them 15 meters under the ground on top of, you know, all that water. That's really terrible. You see all the rescue workers here. Very crazy. Let me see if I can fix the sound so you guys can hear it on, um, yeah, let's see if that helps any. No. Look at that. Look how deep that sinkhole is. Footage from the incident shows the water being pulled into the gaping hole as the partygoers attempt to grasp onto something in order to not be sucked inside. The video also shows the inflatables that were in the pool being swept into the pit and disappearing. Yeah, if you went down in that pit, there's no coming back out, dude. That's crazy. That's crazy. That would not be the way to go, fam. Straight up. You can hear them, they're partying, man. I don't know why I'm getting such a shitty deal here. Look how fast it's just sucking them down, too. Okay, this video is not one to play. The MDA paramedic said, This is a very unusual incident. When I got to the scene, I saw a pit that had opened at the bottom of the empty pool. People who were there at the site told me that the pit opened suddenly. Within a few seconds, all the water of the pool was pulled in. Crazy. Crazy, crazy. Mysterious pink glow in the sky over Mildura, Australia. Videos and pictures. After red lights in the North Pacific Ocean, now the sky turned pink over Mildura, Australia. It was a regular Wednesday evening in sleepy town of Mildura, northern Victoria, Australia, until residents realized the night sky was bathed in a mysterious pink glow. And I wonder what this light was. The unusual sighting was attributed to unusual factors. Alien invasion for one. And, and look at that. That is lit up, dude. But in a rather anticlimactic explanation for the phenomena, a local cannabis facility had been found to be the source of the eerie pink glow. So they were, it was a grow house. Somebody was growing weed, and that's what created the giant pink light. That's funny as hell. <laughs> they thought, aliens are here. No, we're just, we're just smoking dope. 
As per the Guardian, a pharmaceutical company, Can Group, has come forward to confirm that the lights were coming from its local medicinal, can uh, medicinal cannabis facility. They explained that the pink light had escaped when the blackout blinds had been left open. <laughs> wow, dude. Crazy. Moving forward. Spaceweather.com. The CME has arrived, arriving almost exactly on time as CME hit Earth's magnetic field July the 23rd. Approximately 30300 universal time geomagnetic storms are possible in hours ahead. NOAA forecasters say that a G1 to G2 class minor to moderate storms are likely with a slight chance of escalating to category G3 strong. High latitude sky watchers should be alert for auroras. Summer moon dogs. Record breaking heat wave is baking the USA, yet there is some cold air if you know where to look. Last night in Albany, Missouri, Dan Bush photographed signs of ice around the moon. Um, I'm not buying that, y'all. Just saying. The ice around the moon thing. Does that fucking even. The whole sun dogs. That does not look like ice particles around the moon. You know, these halos that are created. I have many theories on what actually creates the halos. You know, some people believe that we're seeing, um, and I'm going to make this image bigger if I can. Some people believe that we're actually seeing uh, the outline of a planetary body. That's what creates that large circle, right? That it's something passing and that we have an artificial moon or an artificial sun. Um... You know, some people believe that it's, you know, a lensing array uh, in the sky. Take a look yourself right here. Look at that. That is pretty strange looking. You know, you can see like something's refracting the light here. Something's refracting light there, like a mirror effect. And that's perfectly round too. And as usual, I do see something here. I notice what looks like a round orb down at the bottom here. I don't know if you guys can see that at home. I remember back in the day I used to do lots of these videos where I would dissect the pictures. Wow, you can see a round orb down here at the bottom. There is something right there. You know, so could that be a refraction of something way bigger? You know, I wonder. Let's see if we can. Let's see if we can, uh change the way it looks a little bit the contrast and then it's got the telltale kind of wispy look here you know I don't know if those would classify as stripes or whatever but just kind of looking you can see down here there's something um, round at the bottom right there see what I'm saying right there Strange indeed, man. Strange indeed. And one of our video cameras in Missouri State Meteor Camera Network caught these rare moon dogs as well as bright moon halo, says Bush. Moon dogs are the bright spots in the left and the right of the moon, like the circular moon halo that are caused by ice crystals and high clouds. This sort of phenomenon is usually associated with cold winter weather. These particular icy clouds may have been blown off from the tops of some storm from the north and west of Missouri. Yeah, it's associated with winter weather and it's like blazing fucking hot. It's so hot, it's like sucking pools underneath the ground. They're like, yeah, this is uh, ice crystals. I mean, there just so happens to be on a meteor cam and there is a round object there at the bottom too. So just saying. Looking down here, All Sky Fireball Network. July 22nd, the network reported 22 fireballs. See here, the diagram of the inner system, the fireball intersects as a single point of Earth. NEOs, and on July 23rd, 2022, there were 2,283 potentially hazardous asteroids. 
couple of them here 2022 OF was in three lunar distances and had a 20 meter diameter and 2022 2022 OD uh, was two lunar distances and a diameter of 30 meters very interesting Six meteor showers will likely offer better views than the Perseids this summer. And this is what I mean. We got meteor showers, all types of shit coming in. The nearly full moon will likely spoil views of the Perseids this year. There are six minor meteor showers that might give you the chance to spot shooting stars. And let's take a look. Um... This year, nearly full moon will seriously hamper Perseid. The radiance for the most meteor showers will be concentrated in the southern part of the sky, roughly 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. local time. A radiant in the place of the sky where the paths of the meteors are extended backwards would intersect from a particular constellation. Many people are misled into thinking that this is the best place to look for these meteors, but in reality, the radiant is an optical illusion. These meteors are traveling on parallel paths, but due to our perspective, the meteors appear to be darting from this particular spot in the sky we have the alpha capricornets on july 26th which extends from july 10th to august 15th which is july new moon two days away the pisces austronids july 15th to august 10th on july 28th the height of the pisces Austrians, the moon will be in a new phase, so you won't have to worry about it. Delta Aquarids, from July 12th to August 23rd, the Aquarids, the water carrier. Alpha Capricornids, Iota Aquarids, and the Perseids and Kappa Cygnids. So we've got quite a few different meteor showers coming up as well. Near-Earth asteroids we've never seen before, and I think I already had this one popped up. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I know I'm a little all over the place tonight. The inner solar system spins much more slowly than it should. Now scientists may know why. The inner solar system spins much more slowly than the laws of modern physics predicts. A new study may help to explain why. A thin disk of gas and dust known as a accretion disk spirals around young stars. These disks where planets form contain leftover star forming material that is a fraction of the star's mass according to the law of conservation of angular momentum. The inner part of the disk should spin faster than material spirals slowly inward toward the star similar to how figure skaters spin faster when they bring their arms closer to their bodies. However, previous observations have shown that the inner solar system, the region of the solar system that extends from the sun to the asteroid belt, includes the terrestrial planets, does not spin as fast as predicted by the law of conservation of angular momentum. Using new simulations of virtual, virtual accretion disks, scientists at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, have demonstrated how particles in the accretion disk interact. Angular momentum is proportional to velocity times radius at the law of angular momentum. Conservation states that the angular momentum in a system stays constant. So if the skater's radius decreases because they have drawn their arms in, then the only way to keep angular momentum constant is to increase the spin velocity. So why is momentum of the inner accretion not conserved? The magnetic field generating turbulence may slow down the rotational speed of infalling gas, according to the statement. So it's a turbulence within the magnetic field that's actually slowing down the spin in the inner solar system. It makes sense, right? Um, the field would be tighter in smaller bodies. And it says that to better understand angular momentum loss, Bellin studied the trajectories of individual atoms, ions, and gas in accretion disk, and in turn how particles behave during collisions, while charged particles, electrons, and ions are affected both by gravity, magnetic fields, neutral atoms are affected only by gravity. Right, and this is collisions too, more collisions in the inner solar system because there's more traffic as well, so... NASA's new toy may have already spotted the oldest known galaxy. Remarkable normal looking galaxies remarkably close to the Big Bang. And I don't know about you, but I'm to the point I don't believe any of these images anymore. Like I never really did. You know, but 
looking at these, are, they just look like plasma. Yeah, plasma moon, not in the same place here in the California mountains. You look at the same time. I noticed that a few years back, um, you know, uh, in the skies here in Ohio, I would see the the moon, you know, it looked off and, uh, where it would normally be or the sun would be slightly off where it would rise and set. And I believe at one point, I'm trying to think, I believe it was a year or so ago, uh, there were people coming up with calculations of the sun rising and setting as much as like 20 degrees north, north, east, uh, away from where it, it normally sets. So, um, your house sits on a sinkhole and your cupboards came off the ceiling and wall about to fall down. One time your house tattled like giants banging on the walls and windows. What? What the fuck? Uh, that's crazy. You need to get out of that place then, man. Get you a new crib, <laughs> you know? Sounds like you're going to be sucked into a sinkhole next. And this is one of the designs of the James West Telescope. The image of Waze links to reveal the universe's first stars and galaxies. We're going to go ahead and switch over to this document in just a second. Let me get through these last little articles here. Asteroid impact comparison video gets scarier and scarier. YouTube channel Metaball Studios is full of mind-blowing size comparisons that help us understand our place in the world, but the latest blow-ups of the planets by the end compares the destruction caused by various sized asteroid impacts, and it's harrowing to watch. That's thanks in part to production value. The video below includes Michael Bay-like camera angles and asteroids flaming into our atmosphere and pummeling well-known targets in New York City and Paris. I don't think I can play the sound, but I will play the video here. So, this is Asteroid Impact Comparison. We'll play just a little bit of this. This is Metaball Studios. I would like to... Try to get this audio to where you guys can hear it too. There we go. And see, they're going through and showing you the different impact scenarios for the size of the asteroid. See, next impact, size 20 meters, similar to the Chelyabinsk event. The frequency about every 70 years, energy air burst 18 Hiroshima bombs, explosion height 21 kilometers, impact area, New York City. some reason the stream is like not streaming on YouTube I don't know if it's like that on the other channels or not Let's see how we got it it's weird everybody see me at home I don't know why the stream isn't changing here on YouTube man very strange what the hell it's like it's I don't know, guys. Come on, man. <laughs> Crazy. I don't know what is going on with this, guys. OK. 
okay so there we go looks like we're what in the hell y'all All right, so maybe it's on a delay. It says sun outburst prompts warning to moderate solar storm this weekend. Forecasters expect the worst of the solar storm to hit sometime around 8 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. Uh, intense geomagnetic storms are possible in the coming days as Earth's magnetic field bombarded by a solar storm cloud. Forecasters expect the worst solar storm to hit around Friday, July 22nd at 8 p.m. in the early mornings of Saturday. During the time of full halo, CME will reach Earth's magnetic field. Forecasters note that auroras may be visible from farther from the poles in their usual latitudes. We're going to go ahead and move here to the Adam and Eve story. You know, and this is what I think it's all ultimately boiling down to at the end of the day, right? Uh, due to the uh, cycles of the sun, um, probably from a binary companion star, uh, this in essence creates a magnetic reversal and this is what brings on the mud floods and the catastrophe and you know all of that uh, that, that we have dealt with for um, cycle after cycle that brings you know destruction you know so let's go here I don't know why I'm getting all froze up here, guys. at the very beginning here the next cataclysm Noah, Adam, Eve, Vishnu, and Osiris, what do they have in common? They represent eras and ages apart, and yet somehow they all join hands in the next cataclysm and walk with us. And here we go. I think it's this one right here, the next cataclysm. With a rumble so low as to be inaudible, growing, throbbing, then fuming into a thundering roar, the earthquake starts. Only it's not like any earthquake in recorded history. In California, the mountains shake like ferns in a breeze. The mighty Pacific rears back and piles up into a mountain of seawater more than two miles high, then starts its race eastward. With the force of a thousand armies, the wind attacks, ripping, shredding everything into its supersonic bombardment. The unbelievable mountains of the Pacific seawater follow the wind eastward, bury in Los Angeles and San Francisco as if they were but grains of sand. Nothing but nothing stops the relentless, overwhelming onslaught of wind and ocean. Across the continent, the thousand mile per hour wind wreaks its hell, its unholy vengeance everywhere, mercilessly, unceasingly. Every living thing is ripped into shreds while being blown across the countryside. And earthquakes have no place untouched. In many places, the Earth's molten sublayer breaks through and spreads a sea of white hot liquid fire to add to the Holocaust. Within three hours, the fantastic wall of seawater moves across the continent, burying the wind ravaged land under two miles of seething water coast to coast. And think about this too. Uh, we're seen you know in the the articles we just showed earlier you know water coming into the streets 
um, giant sinkholes opening up, water completely being sucked under and, you know, disappearing from lake beds, leaving them stark dry and bare. I mean, we're already seeing evidence of this stuff. Smoke plumes, electrical anomaly, anomalies like transformers exploding. Um, you know, all of these things, you know, are indicators, including we look at like the doomsday glacier and the melting of the glacial ice. Um, you know, it, it raining the, the, the ice and the hail in one part of the world and then you're having sweltering heat in another. In a fraction of a day, all vestiges of civilization are gone. And the great cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, New York, Boston are nothing but legends. Barely a stone is left where millions walked just a few hours before. A few lucky ones who managed to find shelter from the screaming winds on the lee side of a high mountain peak, such as Mount Massive, watched a sea of molten fire breaking through the quaking valleys below. The raging waters follow at supersonic speeds, piling higher and higher, screaming over the molten earth fire and rising almost to their feet. Only great high mountains such as this one can withstand the cataclysmic onslaught. North America is not alone in her death throes. Central America suffers the same cannonade, wind, earth, fire, and inundation. South America finds the Andes not high enough to stop the cataclysmic violence pounded out by nature in her berserk rage. In less than a day, Ecuador, Peru, and western Brazil are shaken madly by the devastating earthquake. The Andes are piled higher and higher by the Pacific supersonic onslaught as it surges over itself against the mountains. The entire continent is burned by molten earth fire, buried under cubic miles of catastrophically violent seas, then turned into a frozen hell. Everything freezes. Man, beast, plant, and mud are all rock hard in less than a few hours. Europe cannot escape the onslaught. The raging Atlantic piles higher and higher on itself, following the screeching wind eastward. The Alps, Pyrenees, Eudos, and Scandinavian mountains are shaken, then heaved even higher when the wall of seawater strikes. Western Africa and the sand of Sahara vanish in nature's wrath, under savage attack by wind and ocean. The area hounded by Zaire, South Africa, and Kenya suffers only severe earthquakes and winds. Little inundation. Survivors there marvel at the sun standing still in the sky for nearly half a day. Eastern Siberia and the Orient suffer in a, str a strange fate indeed, as though a giant subterranean Sith sweeps away the earth's foundations accompanied by the wind and its streaming symphony of supersonic death and destruction. In the Azric Basin leaves ice, polar home, eastern Siberia, Manchuria, China, and Burma are subjected to the same annihilation in South America. Wind, earth fire, inundation, and freezing. Jungle animals are shredded to ribbons by the wind, piled into mountains of flesh and bone, and buried under avalanches of a homogenized seawater and mud. Then comes a sudden, seemingly infinite supply of terrible, instantly paralyzing temperature drop of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Not man, beast, plant, muck, earth, nor water is left unfrozen in the entire eastern Asian continent, most of which remains below sea level. Antarctica and Greenland with their ice caps now rotate around the earth in the torrid zone, and the fury of wind and inundation marches on for six days. During the sixth day, the ocean starts to settle in their new homes, running off the high grounds. On the seventh day, the horrendous rampage is over. The Arctic Ice Age is ended and a new Stone Age begins. The ocean, the great homogenizers have laid down another deep layer of mud over the existing strata and the Great Plains, as exposed in the Grand Canyon, Painted Desert, Monument Valley, and the Badlands. The Bay of Bengal Basin just east of India is now at the North Pole. The Pacific Ocean just west of Peru is at the South Pole. Greenland and Antarctica now rotating equatorially find their ice caps dissolving madly in the tropical heat.
Massive walls of water and ice surge toward the oceans, taking everything from mountain plains and gushing, heaving paths, while creating immense seasonal moraines. In less than 25 years, ice caps are gone, and the oceans around the world rise over 200 feet with the newfound water. The torrid zone will be shrouded in fog for five for generations from the enormous amounts of moisture poured into the atmosphere by the melting ice caps. New ice caps begin to form in the polar areas. Greenland and Antarctica emerge with verdant tropical foliage. Australia is a new unexplored continent in the north temperate zone with only a few handfuls of survivors populating its vastness. New York lies at the bottom of the Atlantic, shattered, melted by earth fire, and covered by unbelievable mountains of mud. Of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas, and Boston, not a trace is left. They will all join the legends of the seven cities of Sitola. What's left of Egypt emerges from its Mediterranean inundation new and higher, still the land of the ages. The commonplace of our time becomes a mysterious ball back of the new era. A new era, yes. The cataclysm has done its work. The greatest population regulator of all does once more for man what he refuses to do for himself and the planet on which he lives and drives the pitiful few who survive into a new stone age after this cataclysm we join noah adam and eve atlantis mu and olympus and jesus joins osiris zeus and vishnu yeah so, I mean, this is a regular occurrence when you think about it. These cycles are, you know, and uh, I believe we are at definitely, there's no doubt about it in, in my mind that we are at that time, you know, where it's a, uh, we're getting ready to um, see things wrap up in that way again. That's why we're seeing all the mysterious, uh, you know, anomalies, um, happening all over the place like i said we have uh you know the hail and ice raining down uh you know torrential rain and flooding and tidal waves and all of these different things that are taking place large sinkholes and entire lake beds disappearing you know this is not uh what we consider normal you know weather or normal climate here on earth and then you see you know the solar cycles and the eruptions of the sun um on the poles, uh, you know, uh, we're seeing all of the ice begin to break up. And, you know, this is one of the indicators in the Lost Book of Inky. You know, when the this ice breaks up, it sends tidal waves across the world. So, I mean, these are all um, and seismic and volcanic activity. You know, the, the crustal displacement that's taking place. You know, it's like... Uh, we're on the edge man we're we're on the edge and um the world continues to go on like like nothing's gonna happen or and maybe nothing will in our lifetime who knows but if you paid attention to the migrating magnetic poles you know that they have moved exponentially fast over the last couple of years and we're literally um less than a hundred miles away from that 40 degree point you know the swift shifting of the atmosphere under the impact of a gaseous part of the comet the drift of air attracted by the body of the comet and the rush of the atmosphere resulting from inertia when the earth stopped rotating or shifted its poles all contributed to produce hurricanes of enormous velocity and force and of worldwide dimensions Manuscript, Troano, and other documents of the Mayas describe a cosmic catastrophe during which the ocean fell on the continent and a terrible hurricane swept the earth, like what we just talked about, right? Fire, water, flood, inundation. The hurricane broke up and carried away all towns and all forests, exploding volcanoes, tides sweeping over mountains, and impetuous winds threatened to annihilate humankind and actually did annihilate many species of animals. The face of the earth changed. Mountains collapsed. 
Other mountains grew and rose over the onrushing cataract of water driven from oceanic spaces. Numberless rivers lost their beds, and wild tornadoes moved through the debris descending from the sky. The end of the world age was caused by Huracan, the physical agent that brought darkness and swept away houses and trees and even rocks and mounds of earth. From this name is derived hurricane, the word we use for a strong wind. Huracan destroyed the major part of the human race, and the darkness swept by wind, resinous stuff fell from the sky and participated with fire and water in destruction of the world. For five days, save the burning naphtha and burning volcanoes, the world was dark since the sun did not appear. And um, <clears throat> in the Adam and Eve story too, it's a seven day process, right? The inundation and flood. And he's talking about in five days. And notice in the Bible, you know, God created the, the world in seven days too, right? So uh, we look at, uh, the Bible as well it says that a day is a thousand years a thousand years a day to God so this would also be a 7,000 year creation cycle there's many different ways to look at this just saying <clears throat> And if we also think about, um, you know, the manna raining from heaven and all of that as well, the burning naphtha and all of that raining down, the theme of a cosmic hurricane is reiterated time and time again in the Hindu Vedas and the Persian Avesta and the Diluvium Venti, the deluge of wind, is a term known for many ancient authors. In the section, The Darkness, I quoted rabbinical sources on the exceedingly strong west wind that endured for seven days when the land was enveloped in darkness and the hieroglyphic inscription from El Arish about nine days of upheaval, when there was such a tempest that nobody could leave the palace or see the faces of those beside him, and the eleventh tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which says that six days and a night, the hurricane, deluge, and tempest continued sweeping the land, and mankind perished almost all together. In the battle of the planet god Marduk with Tiamat, he, Marduk, created the evil wind and the tempest and the hurricane and the fourfold wind and the sevenfold wind and the whirlwind and the wind which had no equal. The Mayoras narrate that amid a stupendous catastrophe, the mighty winds, the fierce squalls, the clouds, dense, dark, fiery, wildly drifting, wildly bursting, rushed on creation. In their midst, Twahermati, father of the winds and storms, and swept away giant forests and lashed the waters into billows whose crests rose high like mountains. The earth groaned terribly and the ocean fled. The earth was submerged into the ocean, but was drawn by Tefanau, relate of the Aborigines Pamutu and Polynesia. The new isles were baited by a star. In the month of March, the Polynesians celebrated a god, Tafunu. In Arabic, Typhoon is a whirlwind, and Typhoon is a deluge. And the same word occurs in Chinese <coughs> as Typhong. It appears as though the noise of the hurricane was overturned by a sound not unlike the name Typhon, as if the storm were calling him by name. The cosmic upheaval proceeded with a mighty strong west wind, but before the climax, in the simple words of the scriptures, the Lord caused the sea to go, to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites were on the shore of the sea of the passage of the climax of the cataclysm. The name Jam Suf is generally rendered as Red Sea. The passage is supposed to have taken place either at the Gulf of Suez or Aqaba Gulf of the Red Sea. But sometimes the site of the passage is identified as one of the inner lakes on the route from Suez to the Mediterranean. It is argued that Suf means reed papyrus reed and since papyrus reed does not grow in salt water jam suf must have been a lagoon of fresh water and think about uh reed lost book of inky when inky speaks to the reed wall right and we're thinking about water people are made of water just saying we'll not enter here into a discussion of where the sea of passage was the inscription was on the shrine found in El Arish may provide some indication where the pharaoh was engulfed by the whirlpool in any event, the, topo the 
topographical distribution of sea and land did not remain the same as before the cataclysm of the days of the Exodus, but the name of the sea of the passage Dam Suf is derived not from reed but from hurricane, Suf, Sufa in Hebrew. In Egyptian, the Red Sea is called Shari, which signifies a sea of percussion, Mer Percussionis, or the sea of the stroke or of disaster. The Haggadah of Passover says, Thou didst sweep the land of Moph and Noph on the Passover, the hurricane that brought to an end of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, the blast of heavenly displeasure. And the language of Manitho swept through every corner of the world in order to distinguish in the traditions of the peoples the diluvium venti of cosmic dimensions from local disastrous storms and other cosmic disturbances. Like disappearances of the sun or change of the sky must be found accompanying the hurricane. In the Japanese cosmogenical myth, the sun goddess hid herself for a long time in a heavenly cave in fear of the storm god. The source of light disappeared, the whole world became dark, and the storm god caused monstrous destruction. Gods made terrible noise so that the sun should reappear, and from their tumult the earth quaked. In Japan and in the vast extent of the ocean, hurricanes and earthquakes are not rare occurrences. But they do not disturb the day-night secession, nor is there any resulting permanent change in the sky and its luminaries. The sky was low, relate the Polynesians of Tecofo Island, and then the winds and water spouts and the hurricanes came and carried up to the sky its present height. When a world cycle is destroyed by wind, says the Buddhist text on the world cycles, the wind also turns the ground upside down and throws it into the sky. In an area of 100 leagues in extent, 200, 300, 500 leagues in extent, crack and are thrown upward by the force of the wind, and do not fall again but are blown to powder in the sky and annihilated. And the wind throws up also into the sky the mountains which encircle the earth. They are the ground, to powder, and destroyed. The cosmic wind blows and destroys a hundred thousand times ten million worlds. And if it's talking about that, I wonder if they're talking about asteroids too, right? And saying <clears throat> that they are literally thrown up the... The winds throw also in the sky the mountains which encircle the earth, right? That would be asteroids. The ocean tides are produced by the action of the sun and to a larger extent by that of the moon. A body larger than the moon or one nearer to the earth would act with greater effect. A comet with a head as large as the earth passing sufficiently close would raise the waters of the oceans miles high. The slowing down or stasis of the earth and its rotation would cause a tidal recession of water towards the poles. But the celestial body nearby would disturb this poleward recession, drawing the water towards itself. The traditions of many peoples persist that the seas were torn apart and their water heaped high and thrown upon the continents. In order to reestablish that these traditions refer to one and the same event, or at least to an event of the same order, we must keep to this guiding sequence. The great tide followed a disturbance in the motion of the earth. The Chinese annals, which I have mentioned and which I extend, intend to quote more extensively in a subsequent section, say that in the time of Emperor Yahoo, the sun did not go down for ten days. The world was in flames, and in their vast extent the waters overtopped the great heights, threatening the heavens with their floods. The water of the ocean was heaped up and cast upon the continent of Asia. A great tidal wave swept over the mountains and broke in the middle of the Chinese Empire. The water was caught in the valleys between the mountains and the land was flooded for decades. The tradition of the people of Peru tell that for a period of time equal to five days and five nights, the sun was not in the sky, and then the ocean left the shore, and with a terrible din broke over the continent, the entire surface of the earth was changed in this catastrophe. Let me see if I can pull something up real fast here. Let's see if we can get this to pop up real fast.
right. <clears throat> Let me make this a little bigger here. Now think about looking at Planet Nine, right, or Nemesis. Planet Nine, the hypothetical planet in the outer region of the solar system, its gravitational effects could explain the unusual clustering of orbits for a group of extreme trans-Neptunian objects and bodies beyond Neptune that orbit the Sun at distances averaging more than 250 times out of the Earth. These TNOs tend to make their closest approach to the Sun in one sector and their orbits are similarly tilted. These improbable alignments suggest that an undiscovered planet may be shepherding the orbits of the most distant known solar system objects. Nonetheless, some astronomers do not think that the hypothetical planet exists at all based on detailed observations and studies, which there are now um, you know, many studies from Mike Brown and others that say that it's it, probably is real and that it does exist. Based on earlier considerations, this hypothetical super Earth-sized planet would have had a predicted mass of 5 to 10 times that of the Earth and an elongated orbit 400 to 800 times as far as the Sun of the Earth. Constantine Batyan and Michael E. Brown suggested that Planet 9 could be the core of a giant planet that was ejected from its original orbit by Jupiter during the genesis of the solar system. And remember the story of Venus being ejected from the king planet Jupiter as well. And the binding of Prometheus and Venus perhaps being a comet. So keep that in mind. Uh, even uh, the 2012 prophecy of the Egyptians talking about Venus making its pentagram in the sky too. You know, so it's always been huge in this as well. Others propose that the planet was captured from another star like the sun even, and was once a rogue planet and that it had formed on a distant orbit and was pulled into an eccentric orbit by a passing star. As of May 2020, no observation of Planet 9 had been announced while sky surveys such as Wide Field Infrared, WISE, and PANSTAR did not detect Planet 9. They have not yet ruled out the existence of a Neptune diameter object in the solar system. The ability of these past sky surveys to detect Planet 9 was dependent on its location and characteristics. Further surveys of the remaining regions are ongoing using NEOWISE, the 8-meter Subaru telescope. Unless Planet 9 was observed, its existence is purely conjecture. Severe alternative theories have been proposed to explain the observed clustering of TNOs. <clears throat> and these are artist impressions. And, matter of fact, let's go back here. Fifty-two. Yeah, Venus, the most incredible story. And this is what I'm saying. Um, Venus, you know, uh, it's been... And if you think about it, if it was thrown out of the orbit of Jupiter, Jupiter was the king planet um, in older religions, older religious texts. It talks about how Jew Peter, right? The Jewish people actually worshipped Jupiter as the sun. And it was our sun for a time. Um, perhaps, and then they switched to Saturn. Perhaps something happened, some type of, you know, cataclysm. Some type of disruption. Maybe, you know, when the cycles, I've told you about uh, the theory of Jupiter ascending every 12,500 years. That Saturn and Jupiter actually cross past the Earth every 6,500 years. And every 12,500 years that Jupiter actually uh, times it right and ascends directly over the Earth. And this could be the Earth may have been a satellite of you know, Jupiter at one time or of Saturn at one time and gotten pulled out of orbit and now is orbiting the sun. Because you got to think there's many tales that say the Earth has had multiple suns that through these different ages that we get a different sun in each age, right? Which uh, I will do a video going through, um, 
you know, the, the planetary cycles and catastrophism, um, you know, probably within the next day or so. But to get more into detail with that. You know, so the whole Planet Nine thing could really, you know, in this comet planet, right, when the comet will run, all these prophecies from Nostradamus, you know, what if it was Venus and its orbit has just kind of stabilized and that's why it's been so big in the occult and all of that with um, the pentagram and the way that it, uh, you know, does its retrograde movements and all of that. <clears throat> the most incredible story. <clears throat> Excuse me. The most incredible story of miracles. And I would love to hear what you guys think. We're not just seeing a picture, just sounds. The video is not showing. Um, I don't know what you're t talking about. The video is not showing. Um, I can see the video on YouTube. So, I'm not showing a video. I'm, uh, showing a document here so the most incredible story of miracles is told about joshua ben noon who was pursuing the canaanite kings at beth horon story behind the belief of the most imaginative or most pious person but that of the sun and the moon shall halt in their movement across the firmament this could only be the product of a fancy and poetic image or a metaphor of a hideous implausibility when imposed on a subject for belief it manifests even a warning and reverence for a supreme being Is true aerolites or meteorites reach our Earth continually, sometimes by the thousands or ten thousands, but no dislocation of precise turning round and round has ever been perceived. This does not mean that a larger body or a larger number of bodies could not strike the terrestrial sphere. The large number of asteroids between the orbits of planet Mars and Jupiter suggest that at some unknown time, Another planet revolved there. Now only these meteorites follow approximately the path along which the destroyed planet circled the sun. Possibly a comet ran into it and shattered it. The comet may strike our planet is not very probable, but the idea is not absurd. The heavenly mechanism work was almost absolute precision, but unstable. Their way lost comets by the thousands, by the millions revolved in the sky, and their interference may disturb the harmony. Some of these comets belong to our system. Periodically they return, but not at very exact intervals. Owing to the perturbations caused by gravitation toward the larger planets when they fly too close to them. But innumerable other comets often seen only through telescope come flying from immeasurable spaces of the universe at very great speed and disappear, possibly forever. Some comets are visible only for hours, some for days or weeks or even months. Might it happen that our earth, that under our feet, would roll toward perilous collision with a huge mass of meteorites, a trail of stones flying at enormous speed around and across our solar system? The probability was analyzed with fervor during the last century from the time of Aristotle who asserted that a meteorite which fell at Egapostami when a comet was glowing in the sky had been lifted from the ground by the wind and carried in the air and dropped over that place. Until the year 1803 when on April 26 a shower of meteorites fell at Legal, France and was investigated by B.O. for the French Academy of Sciences. The scholarly world in the meantime lived Copernicus, Galileo, Galilei, Kepler, Newton, and Huygens who did not believe that such a thing as a stone falling from the sky was possible at all. Even this, despite many occasions when stones fell before the eyes of a crowd, did the arrow light in the presence of the Emperor Maximilian and his court in Schenhain, Alsay, on November 7th, 1492. And I don't know, you know, if these stones are anything more than plasma, right, as it hardens into the mineral or metal that the gas ball, uh, you know, it was... Um, or the gases that make up the ball of plasma as it's heated, uh, once it hardens back up into the, the mineral or the metals, actually creates the stone or the rock. That's my theory about this. If the head of a comet should pass very close to our path, so as to affect a distortion in the career of the Earth, another phenomenon besides disturbed movement of the planet would probably occur. A rain of meteorites would strike the Earth and would increase to a torrent, Stones scorched by flying through the atmosphere would be hurled on home and head. 
and the book of Joshua, two verses before the passage about the sun that was suspended on high for a number of hours without moving to the occident, we find this passage. As they, the Canaanite kings, fled from Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon, the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them to Azekah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones, stones of Barad, than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. The author of the book of Joshua was surely ignorant of any connection between the two phenomena. He could not be expected to have any knowledge of the nature of aerolites, but these forces of attraction between celestial bodies and the like. And these phenomena were recorded to have occurred together. It is improbable that the records were invented. The meteorites fell on the earth in a torrent. They must have fallen in very great numbers, for they struck down more warriors than the swords of the adversaries. To have killed persons by the hundreds or thousands in the field, a cataract of stones must have fallen. And I think it's very interesting how there's always a war, too, when this shit happens. That's how you know that these celestial bodies... um, they have an effect on the electromagnetic field and i believe the electromagnetic field is the veil right it is the firmament and when it's affected um consciousness changes right so you have fluctuations within our star um because it's affected by celestial bodies so it's giving off more or less radiation and you know burst of plasma and energy which then in turn affects our magnetic field which would also be affected by a celestial body as well uh, causing turbulence within that allowing more cosmic rays and radiation to come in uh, essentially affecting human consciousness right and as consciousness is affected you know if we go from one state of consciousness to an extreme elevated state, you know, we're sound asleep one moment and then next moment we're full fucking blast and everybody's, you know, got ET awareness. Well, I could imagine, you know, that people would go crazy and shit like that, you know, especially people that weren't ready for all of that, you know, when the veil is pulled. Um, and what, you know, that instant manifestation and instant attraction of the magnetism if you're doing dark and evil shit well your your world would you know instantly become dark and evil so those who are living peaceful lives when the shift in awareness happened probably walked through untouched those who were already in a dark low state of distortion in frequency when the veil drops they probably see you know hell as their reality you know and are attracting more of that to them you know when the veil drops we know that the power of consciousness you know put it this way uh if my consciousness is in a high state i can speak to you and my consciousness will will reach your consciousness at whatever state it's at so if i'm at a real high frequency and you're at a real low frequency my consciousness can speak to yours at whatever frequency it's at and i can understand you from whatever frequency i'm at so it depends on the individual person and if our thoughts actually create our reality well imagine if we're in a low vibratory state when the veil drops and the magnetic field fluctuates and reverses well then our reality would be instant hell it would be instant distortion instant abstraction you know low craziness and if we're at a high vibratory state when the the magnetic field has this turbulence and the veil drops well we would be essentially untouched by all these things because we'd be in such a high conscious state that we'd be out of reach of the lower distortions if that makes sense Sun and moon stood still in heaven, and thou didst stand in thy wrath against our oppressors. All the princes of the earth stood up, the kings of the nations had gathered themselves together. Thou didst destroy them in thy fury, and thou didst ruin them in thy rage. Nations raged from fear of thee, kingdoms tottered because of thy wrath. Thou didst pour out thy fury upon them, thou didst terrify them in thy wrath. The earth quaked and trembled from the noise of thy thunders. Thou didst pursue them in thy storm. Thou didst consume them in the whirlwind. 
their carcasses were like rubbish. The wide radius over which the heavenly wrath swept and emphasized in the prayer, all the kingdoms tottered. And where are the kingdoms, right? The kingdom of heaven is within. New Jerusalem is the, the third temple, the holy city. It's your pineal gland, right? It is the, the place of God or your consciousness. So all of these kingdoms that were tottering and being destroyed, I believe, was, you know, this you know, ionized body passing, creating extreme, you know, uh, changes with magnetic frequency. We know that electromagnetic frequency alters our perception and, uh, you know, it can even change the way that we feel. I mean, just a million different things. And you see, these are the different, uh, oh, you guys can see this. And I am just showing images, by the way. I'm not running videos for those of you guys who um, were saying you couldn't see or whatever. These are just images. I'm not showing no videos. But scientists at Harvard, the Black Hole Initiative, developed a new method to find black holes. The true nature of the hypothesized planet 9. This elliptical orbit. You know, notice a lot of it. And if you think about... Um, all the different satellites that they've, you know, Osiris Rex and Lucy, uh, they're all located by Venus and Mars. You know, the planets Venus and Mars. And Mars, the red planet, it's been ripped to dust, basically, um, the atmosphere. And it's always uh, included in these old tales of destruction. Mars is, its shadow of pestilence and all of that. And the binding of Prometheus as well. So I believe those two bodies, more than any of them, have something to do with all this. If we look here, Nibiru to the Babylonians was a celestial body associated with the god Marduk. The name is Akkadian and means a crossing place or a place of transition. In most Babylonian texts, it's identified with the planet Jupiter. In Tablet 5 of the Enuma Elish, it may be the Pole Star, which at the time was Thuban or possibly Kokob Ursa Minor. The term Nibiru comes from Sumerian cuneiform tablets and writings dating 5,000 years old. The term Nibiru means planet of the crossing and its cuneiform sign was often a cross or various winged disc. The Sumerian culture was located in the fertile lands between the Euphrates and Tigris River, the southern part of today's Iraq. Due to the use and opposition in the phrase Itibiru, who used to cross, Landsberger and Kinnear Wilson suggest that it refers to a stationary point in the heavens in a reconstruction of Tablet 5 in the Enuma Elish by Landsberger and Kinnear Wilson, the world Nibi, Nibiri or Nibiru or Nibinara translated as Pole Star. The authors add in the footnotes applied to Marduk, there is no question in the late periods of Nibiru's a planet whether it's Jupiter or Mercury. However, for the reference translation, Tablet 5, Pole Star is used. You know, and the term Pole Star being used. And if you think about the procession of the equinox and the changing of the ages, it's said that when we go in different ages that we have a different Pole Star, right? So there would be a different, you know, Pole Star at the procession of these equinoxes. But they took down my procession of the equinox video. Just saying. According to these theories, Sumerian cosmology, Nibiru was a 12th member in the solar system family of planets, which include 10 planets, the sun and the moon, catastrophic collision with Tiamat, the planet that was between Mars and Jupiter, would have formed the planet Earth, the asteroid belt, and the moon. This is a result of one of Nibiru's host satellites colliding with Tiamat, approximately leaving half a planet comparable to Pan to our Pangaea for our current knowledge of the continents of one landmass, leaving deep rifts in the crust beneath the Pacific Ocean. It was until recently thought impossible for lo such large celestial bodies to collide due to intense magnetic force. However, this concept has been given new life since the introduction of Orpheus theory and the simulation of a collision between objects such as our own Earth and an object half its size. And um, just kind of thinking about, you know, that right there, you know, Tiamat and all of that, uh... This kind of, to me, kind of goes back looking at Venus, you know.
Uh, this is the result of a host satellite colliding with Tiamat. Was Earth perhaps a satellite of Jupiter? And was Venus another satellite of Jupiter? Or Mars a satellite of Jupiter, right? Marduk is always huge in these tales as well, right? Marduk. So was there a collision between, um, you know, or a close passing, you know, between Mars and a collision of Venus and the Earth or, you know, something like that, something to that effect? You know, was humanity at one point living on another uh, you know, celestial sphere. We'll be living on Mars. And the collision is what happened. If you look at the first book of Adam and Eve, it talks about multiple destructions happening to the Earth before humanity ever got off the ground. You know? These are just, you know, a few different things to consider. It was the home of technology, advanced human-like alien race, the Anunnaki, a Sumerian myth, who Sitchin claimed survived and later came to Earth. Sitchin also transcribed that their traveling to Earth was the result of their failing atmosphere. Having since been drawn into our solar system from cosmic passing, the atmosphere of Nibiru was subjected to intense external stress from our sun. So, was perhaps this alien species, right, which uh, the intense external stress from the sun, was they like a shadow race? Right, and that's where we get demons and deities and all of that, right? And angels, a shadow race. And perhaps we injected our consciousness into the earth, mingled our consciousness with the the alien race, or the alien race we know as the god of the dead, Osiris, one soul infinitely resurrecting in spirit. We see in the Lost Book of Inky, it talks about humans being a genetic experiment and that Nibiru's atmosphere um, was dwindling away and it had to have gold to be re to replace it. Well, gold in uh, biblical terms means spirit or the heavens, right? So what happened, uh, you know, on Mars or one of these other planets perhaps, and if you look at even a lot of stories talk about, you know, there was a... A natural species that lived here on Earth, we could say even perhaps Neanderthal, and then the alien race from Mars, right? And, and they were like a masculine patriarchal race, uh, something akin to like a Saturnian race, right? When we think about Marduk being, you know, a uh, son of the gods, essentially, and then Inky being the lord of the water, like this mixture between light and darkness, um, this pole star, planet of the crossing. You know, was there a mixing between masculine and feminine? And was Tiamat, you know, the, the feminine dragon, if you will, right? Was it Venus, you know, or was it the Earth? And is Earth kind of this experiment of the two, uh, you know, kind of dragon energies put together, you know, darkness and light. And, you know, these changes and fluctuations in consciousness, are they a result of the co-mingling of the two? You know, just something to consider. Caltech researchers found mathematical evidence suggesting that there may be planet X deep in the solar system. The hypothetical Neptune planets orbits the sun in an elongated uh, orbit far beyond Pluto. The object which researchers nicknamed Planet 9 could have a mass about 10 times out of the Earth or orbit 20 times farther from the sun on average. It may take between 10,000 and 20,000 Earth years to make one full orbit around the sun. And I'm going to do another video... I'm going to do another video on the procession of the equinoxes and the uh, great cycle because the great cycle is 25,000 years, right? So this would definitely, you know, tap right into all of this. They took my video down when I tried to do it. I had a great video on that, by the way. So, um, and see, and this is also coincides with rare alignment, the Milky Way. The planet, the orbit would eventually circular orbit or fly off into space. Sitchin's claims to be pseudoscience. And that's what they do anytime that, you know, uh, we don't fit, our theories don't fit with conventional science. They call it pseudoscience. Later, deeper images were taken. The objects were found to have dense gas clouds in our own galaxy, while others turned out to be very distant. And heralded the discovery of new types of objects, ultra-luminous infrared galaxies. These galaxies are which are the burst of the stars being born. 
and you can see here the different depictions of the gods man you know and uh i don't think it's too too crazy to think that you know this darker race you know the the sons of god or you know and if you ever seen midnight mass um on netflix it shows uh this angel basically he visits this island and that's what he is is like a flying fucking demon you know he's like a vampire he can't go out into the light he feeds off blood um and i would imagine that that's what you know uh, these gods or archons would be like they would be con total shadow beings right and the light being the living soul or the living spirit so we live in a shadow world um, being in the image of god the reflection right <clears throat> which is the shadow the specter and being injected with the spiritual light right so we're like a mixture of both you know and our DNA kind of making up that genetic composition of the two, the double helix. And essentially, you know, that's what transhumanism is trying to do is create the triple helix and bring, you know, a third strand into the mix to combine the two, you know, and make like an infinite God being, basically, you know, man, um, angel and machine all in one so instead of god and man or god and angel or i mean man and angel being put together like we have now spirit and flesh you would have spirit flesh and machine as a triple helix that would be more akin to the transhumanist and that's when you think about um you know saturn being iron and then the graphene and all of that it just makes a lot of sense which i can't really get into that i don't want to get strikes on this channel um but uh i do believe i'm going to wrap it up for tonight i want to ask everybody to uh please hit the like for me if you're in the chat make sure to subscribe